Hall of Fame broadcaster Marty Brenneman here, and he's the best storyteller in the game, and it's time to sit back, relax, and have some laughs. Welcome to the mayor's office, and here's your host, Sean Casey. We're back at it, Chinch. Yes, we, we are. We are back at it, brother. Ooh. Man, I, t- I tell you what, this week's going to be a good one because this is a good friend of ours, both mm-hmm. of ours, and, uh, and uh, you know, some of the stuff he's done in the game, you know, he's a little humble. Probably when yeah. we when we pump him up right here, he's not going to know what to do with himself. Right. But 19 years in the show. That's a lot. I played 12. He played seven more than me. When I got to MLB Network, too, he told me I retired too early. I was like, take it easy over there. I'll bundle you. <laughs> 162 wins. Pretty impressive. Under 380 RA, two-time All-Star, two World Series rings. And one of those was in a uh, pitched game seven in 97 World Series. One of the best lefties I think the game's ever seen. I've faced a lot of them and some of the best. This guy was no doubt one of the best 1999 playoff game uh, play in way game two, 163. We saw one of the nastiest versions of Al Leiter when I was with the Reds two hit shutout yeah, to send the, the Mets to the postseason. Pretty impressive. Has so many unbelievable things done through a no hitter in 96. We'll get to all this stuff, but let's bring in our good friend, our buddy, Al Leiter. What's up, Al? Good, good. I'm yeah. good. All right. So here, Chintz, I'm going to direct this to you. Okay. I've always uh, seen, known, and talked to uh, Sean over the years, as you do. You, you, you crisscross your baseball career. Mm-hmm. And I had no idea until he came onto the network. And in a playful way, only the way Sean could do it, he's like, uh, man, it, like, man. He goes, yeah, that's 163 games. I had uh, I think Aaron Boone was at third base. He goes, I had 99 RBIs. Yeah. Never had 100 RBIs. And he struck me out, and I broke the bat. And I'm like, Sean, I promise you in a 5 nothing game, if I ever knew this ahead of time, not that I'm trying to blow a game, but as much as I love you, I totally would have figured out a way for you to get that RBI. Oh, I had no idea. oh my God. That's great. Such, a great, such a great story. Because, like, I look, I look back at my career, two 99 RBI seasons. I mean, clean it up. I couldn't get the 100 RBI. <laughs> but in that game, 163 versus, versus the Mets, they come into Cincinnati. I'm like, all right, at least I got a shot. To get it right mm-hmm. so al comes out dominating boom starts the game you know everyone in the dugout was like oh this isn't going good then Al- <laughs> alfonso goes deep and you know silences the crowd whatever so now we hear, we're in the ninth and i believe pokey reese that's right with one out in the ninth or leads off the ninth with a triple right is that what happened now he i think so uh, a, double se- double double and then he gets the third it's only the second hit you've given up and i'm like okay you know, at the end, we're down. It doesn't look good because Al's dominating. But I just got to put the ball in play, get my 100 ribby. At least I'll feel good in the offseason. <laughs> Freaking Al's out there just, you know, doing his thing. <laughs> wham, wham, wham. Just cutter, cutter, bam, punches me out. I'm like, Oof. worst case scenario. Like, I, I can't strike out here. So, bam, 99th ribby still on third to this day. And I told Al when I came to the network, dude, I said, a little bit of bitterness still rising my gut a little bit. I'm pissed off I didn't get that 100 RBI. Could you have thrown one? Down the middle, ninety-one. Just let me let me hit a grounder to second, you know, or at least or at least outer half, and let you hit a little base to the left. That's it. That's all I needed, brother. That's all I needed, man. So, Al, talk to us, man. You got a lot of action going on. What's Al Leiter doing these days, brother? I uh, I do nothing. I sit in this room. (laughs) Just count your money. (laughs) Um, Like this. He's like this. Well, I don't know, man. I, I got my, my youngest, Caitlin's a junior. Jack yep. just left to go to Texas and then on to uh, Arizona. So, you know, with, you know, with your crew, like that matters. Yep. Uh, kind of like in my life, I keep busy. I'm, I'm, um, I'm hyper enough and curious enough to always dabble in stuff. But number one is to like be around the kids and the family and all that stuff. So, uh, yeah, you know, yeah. I mean, where we are in the world with the hunker down and all this crazy stuff yeah. that's going on with COVID, um, you know, kind of the, the world has gotten a little yeah. bit smaller. But uh, thankfully, knock on wood, status quo has been pretty good. So I'd say everything is good, man. Really? Well, nice. dude, listen, I, take us through a little bit because we know you, brother, as a friend. So we know you not just as a baseball player. We know you as a colleague at the network. We also know you as a dad. And I think that's a that's where I kind of want to start. Cause I'm a dad too. I have four kids. You know, you have three girls and a son. I have two, two daughters and two sons, um, you know, two in college and then I have two at home and uh, you know, looking through your story, you know, obviously before we get into Jack, I want to kind of go to your girls a little bit because your daughter, Lindsay was a really good volleyball player and um, your other daughters, Carly and Caitlin, they're kind of what into musicals, not really athletes. Yeah. And my daughter, Carly is into volleyball too. And I, 
I love girls volleyball. Like I'm, I'm, I'm so fired up to go watch those games more than I was high school baseball. Cause sometimes that's like watching paint dry, you know, you know, can you take us through like, what's it like raising three girls, dude. And, 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 and you know, being an lighter and that fired up that you are, what's it like raising three girls for you? So case uh, uh, on top of that, to understand my history, I'm one of seven, the last of seven kids. My mother and father had seven kids in nine years. Wow. Six first. I'm a twin. Wow, I watched TV one time. Right? <laughs> <laughs> ah, uh, the, the Irish Catholic. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so here I cut, and my father was like, like crazy old school male chauvinist, like something right, you know, finished World War II. So, to describe like my upbringing, up, up, upbringing was crazy. To it would be to put it mildly, um, with six boys and one girl, in, in you know, in seven kids, six boys at, in a nine year span. So, um, you know, fast forward, meet Lori, start my family, and here I have you know, Lindsay, Carly, uh, yes, Jack, and then Caitlin. So the girls balance, and I know you got two and two, and Chinch, you're not there yet, right? <laughs> no, as no. far as you know, as far as I know. <laughs> Nobody's come knocking on Chinch's no. door yet. No, that's not happening. That is not happening. <laughs> yeah, better not. Yeah. Uh, so, Jess, will kick your rear end. That's right. Yeah, that's uh, true. So, yeah, it's been, you know, it's been awesome, you know, to, to watch your kids. But I'll say this. I, I think as a parent, and I say this a lot, you know, especially being, you know, getting an opportunity to talk to other other dads and moms and and the kids, I, you know, I always think about whatever whatever their endeavor is. I, I kind of call it the holy trinity of of that interest success. Do you love it? Ch you guys know this. Whatever the hell you do, you better love it. Yeah. The second thing is, do you work your friggin' tail off? I mean, work your ass off. I'm talking about where it's unsolicited, you are self-motivated, and you go out there and you work. No matter what it is. We're going to refer to baseball right now, but whatever it is. You, uh, uh, Case, I'm with you. Watching Lindsay play bas uh, uh, volleyball and then yeah. her travel team. Like, it was awesome. Like, I loved watching. It's an exciting sport. So, and then I have, I have, uh, and the last thing is, is, do you want to get better? You know, so if you, if you create that tripod of the love Hard work, and do you want to get better? A lot of people say, "You do you love it," and you say, "Kid, yeah, I love it." Say, so, "Do you work hard?" Oh yeah, yeah, Mr. Lawyer, work hard. Do you want to get better? Like Sean Casey wasn't a three hundred hitter if he wasn't always tinkering and trying and doing things to get better. Oh, the great players we played with, Case, you knew know it, yeah. and I and I saw some of your podcasts, and it's been awesome watching it. Um, and you just had told me on, you talk about another amazing guy is that you know you're always trying to figure out a way to get a little better. You're never really satisfied. And I remember Derek Jeter saying this, and, and I got a, plan, a chance to play eventually with Derek my last year in, in, in the big leagues in 05. And, uh, you know, his thing was, if we don't win, it wasn't a, it, it was a failed year. And here's guy, Derek Jeter, in his first five years, he was in four World Series in the big leagues from 96 to 01 or whatever it was. So that's all he knew. But the idea of, and, and, and uh, Derek expressed this, is that, you know, when you're playing, you never really get a chance to enjoy it. And I hate to say that because it really sucks. I remember seeing Randy Johnson a few years ago and he came over, you know, Randy's really kind of an eclectic dude. He's an amazing photographer. And he came over to me, Case, at, at, at Chinch, and he hugged me. I'm like, hey, Randy. And he's, <laughs> he, Randy says, I'm sorry. I was like, sorry for what? He goes, man, when I played, you know, I was ornery. I was this, I was that. Wow. But I get it. Like, it's this whole, you're chasing this thing mm. and you're scared to death of failure. And, you know, I just read a quote about Keith Hernandez and he was like, you know, I was always worried about like somebody taking my job. So all of that influences greatness to understand that you always have to have the mindset of trying to get a little bit better. Oh, I don't know how the right. hell I got there on that, but no, that was, no, no, no. It. I love it. it. I love it. You know, and, and I, and that, that kind of segues into, into your son because you know, we'd be crazy. You've had, obviously, the things you've done now is awesome. But I know as a dad, you know, when your sons are doing something special and something they love, man, that's something. That's really cool. Can you take us through Jack's journey? Because we obviously got a chance to get to know him over the years with you coming out to the World Series and being at All-Star Games and stuff. But watching his evolution as a player and now being the second pick of the 2021 draft, I mean, that's un that's unprecedented right but take us back 
to Jack's journey in high school when your what your relationship was like with him and, and, and what you were like as a dad on his journey. Yeah. Yeah. So similar to you, you know, I know, you know, you'd send me some videos of your boys and, you know, watching and trying to, you know, tweak and get some ideas to help. Right. I, I think the best way I could describe my me being a father to my son and being a dad and the love that and the connection there, um, you know, at times could be you got to be it's fragile because it could be hurtful. Right. You know, you're still the dad. You're still you love each other and you give him your heart. So then there becomes the oh, the 19 year major leaguer or your 12 year major leaguer, 1500 hits, lifetime 300 hitter. And you're trying to convey all the stuff that you were taught to your kid some level of frustration might come out, you know, so like, that's where the whole separation of like, just, you know, okay, you go teach my kid. You know? <laughs> right. It's either a, yeah. he's going to kill me or I'm going to kill him. Right. But what I did was, and you guys remember Jack, I mean, he's still not the biggest dude. He's just a smidge under six one. Yeah. And Kent, you remember him coming around in fourth grade. You too, Case. I don't yeah. know. What, what year did you Ooh. get to the network? Case. Yeah. I was oh, there first year with you. I'm an OG, bro. 14 oh, years have been together. OG, you and me. So was he nine? Dude, you definitely retired too early. <laughs> I was 34. I was 34 when you told me that. <laughs> it's true. You told him that. <laughs> no, but yeah. Hey, K hey, hey, Chinch, Case comes in. I love him. I hug him. I'm like, what the hell are you doing? He goes, yeah, I'm going to work here. I'm like, wait a minute. You should be still playing. What are you doing? <laughs> yeah, he had 300 the year before. But hey, back on Jack because I am – I am so locked in on Jack right now because yeah. Case knows I'm doing this little documentary with him and uh, Anthony Volpe, and we got I got to hang out with Alan Jack. But the things that impressed me the most about him, and I don't, I wonder if you guys as athletes can agree or disagree with this, but the fact that he was undersized seems like all of that stuff when he was growing up from like eighth grade until probably his sophomore years when he started really developing, right? That kind of looking at all those other guys, I remember you brought him to the draft one year, and he's like, I played with that guy. I like that guy. I played with that guy. And it was like he was starting to go, wait a minute. I'm catching up to these guys. But he had to work seven times as hard to be the undersized kid to, yeah. to get where he was. And that's got to be a testament to, to the upbringing you, you, you gave him, right? Yeah, yeah, Chinch. So, yes, everything you said, check, check, check. And uh, this is where I, I boil it back to. And my, my, my comments and conversations with Jack through the years, as you say, and even before that, right? I mean, I was, you know, he was on, he was barely walking uh, when I was at my apartment in New York City uh, when, uh, you know, we were living up there year round uh, when I was at the Mets. And, um, you know, I had little bounce house balls all over the floor and he would just go around, you know, like a little kid, right? Yeah. Can't Oh yeah, Nick Kenny throws the ball. And we have a whiff ball bat, and he's like hitting crap off the the TV and the lights and all that. And I was like, yeah. So I used to like he'd be he'd be walking around. You know me, I'm crazy at the net. <laughs> and he'd get, you know most people most people when they throw the ball, you know they they take the ball and they you can see people don't you know and they they elbows below your shoulder and they throw like darts right. right. They do the dart throwing. And I'll be I'll be crawling on the floor and Jack would pick up the ball. He's a little guy and he'd start throwing it and I would pick his elbow up and he'd throw. <laughs> and Jack Jack would look at me like, Hey, what are you doing, man? Let me know. So but you know, that yeah. kind of thing. So yeah. here, I, and I, it sounds maniacal, but it's not. But I, I always got to, and especially because how often I was hurt early in my career. I had my first surgery at twenty at, at twenty three years old in nineteen eighty nine. I had my second surgery in uh uh nineteen ninety one. Um, it, you know, there's a lot of doubt in the early part of my career. I did very little as a result of injury. So as a father, um, I was, I always looked at, I, I couldn't hit, like I had guys like Sean Casey. Remember where we at the garden a few years ago and you were in the, you were in the, uh, we we're in the suite. Remember? The oh, yeah, we, were at the, we, were at the, we were at the hockey game. We were at the yeah. And you're game. like, yeah, teaching, yeah. you know, and I still, I still yeah. had this, I still had this dream of, of Jack being uh, like, like Robin Ventura, uh, like, you know, left-handed hitting, third baseman, die, get dirty. Like I didn't want him to be on the mound, right? Uh, yeah. The last thing he needs is to be like Al Leiter, Jack Leiter, he's pitching, right. you know, the comparison, all that bullshit. So my thing was you know, the mechanics of it. And if you always focus on the things that you can control, then, then that's it. Like you control what you can control. And I know it seems like BS that you're reading books, but it's true. Right. And then whatever that is between the love of something, working your tail off and wanting to get better and then focus on the things you can control, the mechanics of it, no matter whether it's a volleyball game or a wrestling or singing or, or dancing or hitting 300 in the big leagues or throwing 95, there's a mechanics to all of it, right? So 
then you get to that to where you're trying to you're trying to conceptualize and teach what you think is optimal and then you roll you roll the dice i used to tell jack all the time it's like jack i don't know what baseball could get to you i know you love it you love being with your boys you love being on travel you know he was he's a guy's guy um it does it get you into college great does it get you to a better school like you chinch you go to columbia maybe jack would have been good at, you know maybe he was only you know maybe you got him into a better college like right. that kind of mindset it was never like hey you're gonna right. be a bad actor going to be the best like bullshit right. he was he was the dude that was batting seventh eighth or ninth on the team uh, purposely i kept him off the mound in, in travel ball because you know you hear the horror stories although it's getting better uh, with pitch counts and that was it like there really wasn't like and, and you're right chintz like i'm telling you case his travel team he batted seventh eighth or ninth when he did get in the game and if there was a three game series on the weekend he would start one of the three games wow and he still loved it yeah. and i didn't mind it cuz I, I i got the vision of all of this and, but he'd come back to the house we'd go in the batting cage he'd get on the mound he would like we'd work mm. I'm like that's how you get better you yeah. work you keep working and working and working I, I, I want to stay here i want to stay here out because man it sounds like the conversations i have with my sons and it's a fine line that you kind of walk because you're like, okay, I need to be a dad, but I also, I also have so much knowledge, but you and I have one thing in common and I was going to go later, but I'm going to go here because I think it fits Harvey Dorfman who without Harvey Dorfman, I probably don't play a day in the big leagues. I know you probably don't have the career that you end up having in the big leagues without Harvey Dorfman. And I know what he meant. Now, Harvey Dorfman was the, was the uh, mental game of baseball. Hey, there you not, go, bro. There you go. This isn't a prop, uh, Chinch. There it is. I have this. I bet I bet he does too. I have this nearby, and every single kid, there you go, every single kid wow. uh, that I talk to, you got the mental uh, – Mental keys to hitting. Look at yeah, that. No, both of them. We're going to play dueling banjos now with Harvey Dorfman. No, yeah. no but I love it. What's Dorfman paying you guys? I, I love it. I love well, it. And, and Harvey and, passed away like passed uh, away. Uh, it's about nine years, years seven years. But my my thing, Al, is that one of the things that when I you know I look back at your <laughs> at your you know what you did with what, what you did with Jack was that I know how big the ABCs of pitching was. I know how big Harvey Dorpin was for you. And you started early in Jack's high school career, started charting his pitches. Right there, you go. The mental ABCs of pitching. And listen, if anyone's listening to this show or watching the show, I tell the same thing. I said, you want to get good wow. at baseball? Anyone, right, Alice, right there, anyone could come and take the swings and throw the ball and all that stuff. But at the end of the day, this is a game of failure. It will eat you up if mentally you're not ready to go. And mentally you don't have some tools. You can't bring a butter knife to a gunfight. And I think an Uzi fight because, you know, that's what the mind is. And when I look at Jack, and I watched him at Vanderbilt, I was lucky enough to catch those games, and I was excited because, you know, he's your son, and, yeah. and you know, I'd known him growing up, and it was, it was fun to watch, man. But one thing I knew, and knowing it from the baseball eye of what I was watching, the way he sequenced pitches, mm. the, way he, the way he would, he would, you know, he had such a demeanor that he could get back into the pitch if he gave up a, a walk or a hit. And I know that was you, Al, and I know that was your yeah. influence. Not every kid has that. Talk, talk to us about the influence of Harvey Dorfman, what he meant to you, but also the fact that you were able to pass that on to your son and it worked. Great. Yeah. Great. So that's awesome case. Uh, I met Harvey Dorfman in 1991. Uh, my first pitching coach, Gil Patterson, who's a longtime pitching coach in uh, was in the big leagues, a coordinator with the Yankees and now is a, the, uh, the pitching coordinator with the Oakland A's. Um, Harvey, how I found out about Harvey was Gil was my first pitching coach in Oneonta, New York in the Penn League. The Yankees got rid of him. He was signed by the A's and he was in the A's system for years. And I knew Gil, I mean, he was a dear friend and he would, we would work on all the mental, you know, the, the mechanics. And he said, Hey, do you, he goes, you know who you need to meet? He goes, you need to meet Harvey Dorfman. I'm like the mental game of baseball guy. He's like, yeah. <laughs> And I said, how could I do that? He goes, the A's hired him years ago, and he was with the Oakland A's, but, you know, like the mental guy, yeah. which is what they didn't do. Chinch, you have no yeah. – when I first got to the big leagues, we didn't have a strength coach. Right. <laughs> no, <laughs> that's true. no, but also back then, too, when you first got to the big leagues, what, what like a head shrinker? That, that, that was kind of looked – Oh, yeah. No, no, too, no. Right? Here, let me hey, – Chinch, let me say this. So I'm in 1985. Uh, I am awful. I go from – I go high school, New Jersey – to Oneana, 
New York Penn League. I held my own. It was a good league for me. That offseason, the New York Yankees got rid of their Sally League team, uh, which was their low A. For, so for a high school kid, people out there might think, like, it's no big deal. Da, da, da. It's a big deal. But, yeah, you, 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 you kind of need – you need a kid to develop at the right pace, right? right? You don't want them to get overwhelmed and then lose confidence, all that crap. So they did away with the Sally League, and the Yankees, you went from the Penn League to the Florida State League. Florida State League back then was a very good league. It was all college guys. There yeah. might have been one or two high school kids sprinkled on a team, but it was, it, was a, it was an experienced league. I go to the Penn League, and I think I end up throwing like 100-something innings, and I walk like 80 or 90 guys. Mm-hmm. Case, I, I, it was like spraying <laughs> balls, thinking every dude that went to University of Miami or yeah. Arizona State, <laughs> I was going to go deep. From, some <laughs> yeah. guy I heard out of UCLA, I had to throw it 105, yeah. and I'm like, it was, it was freaking <laughs> nuclear, nuclear <laughs> loose, right? <laughs> so, right here, I'm going to tell you, Bucky Dent was my manager, and somebody thought it was a good idea to get me hypnotized. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, yeah. me of all people. Yeah, I'm all me the one. That's amazing. <laughs> so wait a minute. So so I listen to Bucky. He goes, yeah, I got this hit. Guy. He goes, he's going to come in. <laughs> he's going to hypnotize you. I'm like, okay. <laughs> so we're at the Fort Lauderdale Stadium. Uh, you know, I get there on the right time. And I go back in this little room. Some guy comes in and we start, you know, whatever. And he's like, okay, lay down. <laughs> I'm telling you, man, the guy's doing the thing <laughs> and he's like trying to do the thing. Yeah. And I'm sitting there going like this and I want to laugh. I want to laugh. <laughs> I'm like, so we get to a point and I just stopped the guy. I'm like, I'm sorry, sir. But like, this just doesn't work for me. Like I am so hyper. I'm following the damn birdie and thinking about like doing my laundry and what's time is lunch. <laughs> Here, Chinch, this is the point. Like, this is where we went. We we came from as a right. sport. Right. If you you if anything was mental, you're yeah. mentally you're, you're not tough enough. Yeah. What do you oh, mean? Yeah. There's right. something I'm wrong tough. with you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, like, uh, like, thing. it's so wrong. Like this is this is all this is almost everything. When I finally figured it out, everything. Th- like that was that was more, more than my 92 mile slider and the burn and burn. like it was this. So. When you say, uh, Case, when you say about uh, Jack, hmm. uh, if, if Jack were to get on this for, for two seconds and you asked him, Jack, what is your job as a pitcher? He will recite something that I've been reciting to him and not just my son, to, to all, all pitchers that, that, uh, that, I, that I encounter, is to be mentally and physically prepared to execute a quality pitch consecutively until either the manager takes the ball or the game is over without allowing the exterior distractions to come into the task at hand. Chinch, I, I probably, I blurred this stuff on there. No, you have, you know, right. That's so good. That is, yeah. that, that's gold. But, but right think there. about it. Wait, here, Click Case, that, I want to hear. Mark that. <laughs> oh, yeah. But I want to, I want to hear, I'm, I'm going to, I want to hear what, what, what Harv said on the hitting side. But here, let me finish that. Not one thing that I say, strike him out. Not one thing that I say, throw right. a shutout. Not one time do I say, get a win. Right. Not one time do I say, go deep into the game or innings or, or battle or, it's all bullshit. Yeah. That what you, what you're trying to do is to be mentally and physically prepared to execute a quality pitch this pitch right. sean casey's i'm going down and away i better not go up and away because he's going to pepper a ball off the left center and then i'm going to go two heaters inside and i'm going to get a big powerful breaking ball hopefully he rolls over and goes the first i could control everything that i just said i didn't say i'm going to strike him out i didn't say anything about result none of it right. and this is where guys get they, when you get lost you get lost into like not knowing what you're doing you got to get back to what you could control so it, it's, it's, it's everything. It was everything for me. I had games where I had nothing. I think it was actually the, the game that I, that I beat all, uh, all um, 30 major league teams. I forget what year it was. I think it was 02 or 01. Um, it was against Arizona in Arizona. Um, and Piazza always used to come down the line, uh, right field, the bullpen in the, uh, behind the fence there, mm-hmm. uh, Case, you know, on yep, the right field yep, line. Yep. So uh, I'm throwing, and I'm telling you, Chinch, I've got nothing. Mm. I promise you. It's not like, oh, yeah, whatever, Al. No, I had nothing. <laughs> I think I might have broke like 88. Mm. So Piazza's coming down, and I told him, I was like, Mike, get out of here. Like, get. I, I didn't want Mike to see the last five minutes of my warm-up because <laughs> wow. he'd be going into like Bobby Valentine's and get somebody to warm up. <laughs> this was the year after the, the uh, D-backs won. So Gonzalez oh, and yeah. uh, Matt Wins and uh, who the heck else is on that team? They had a good team. Yeah. Oh, Mark Race. Oh, yeah. Womack. Yeah, Council. Jay Bell. Yeah. Cal- yeah they were so overloaded. Look, look it up. I forget. I, I went like seven scoreless. 
And and you know what I did? I said, th- this wasn't about like busting the 90 miles an hour to been out of the game. I said, okay, what do I have to do? Hmm. Okay. I got to keep the ball down. I'm not blowing it by anybody. I better hit the freaking glove, move my fastball around, really use both breaking balls. Like it became like a, like a, in my, in my uh, control. And, and I cite that because, because it was, it, the result ended up being successful as there's, not because of what was coming out of Mara, but like how I controlled right. this. Yeah. And yeah. the cool thing yeah. about that no. real quick, didn't you told me, I was like, what do you do when you're watching a game with Jack? Can you tell us when you and Jack watch games, you're constantly pitch sequencing with him, right? Like when you watch the playoffs, this is so cool. Uh, Sean, listen to this. Right. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I've been, I've been kind of messing with Jack, even when he was in high school, once I started seeing like his stuff getting to like, to be able to get big league hitters out. I'll be honest with you. Like, you know, case, you know, whatever. Exactly. I do the same thing. <laughs> yeah. So, so I'll do, I'll do, uh, you know, when, when he would throw, I, I would, I would, I'd have to reinforce it because the only way, you know, you could do something is if you go and do it right. Like the first time you ever got to the big leagues case, it wasn't it like, Oh my God, like I'm in the big leagues. <laughs> yep. Like I, what was it? I don't know. What was your? No, what was I your... first got to the big leagues. Yeah, and then I was then I shit my pants. I'm like, oh my god, that's <laughs> that's David Cohn. That's David yeah. Cohn out there. You know what I mean? Like, you got to actually face David Cohn and Randy Johnson and Greg Maddox, and then go an outlier, then go. Okay, I'm good. Yeah, I'm good. Yes, I can do this. Yes. <laughs> so, like anything else in life, once you experience it and hopefully get good result, you know, it becomes part of your DNA. You're like, oh, I can yeah. do this, but. You can you can say it to your blue in the face. Somebody's got to actually experience it, right? Chance, I'll even for, say for you. I mean, yeah, we're yeah. talking baseball, but, right? But you're a hell of a producer. You were the best that we had. Thank but you. like when you first time you ever sat in that seat, Clueless. I'm sure you had the same like, oh my god, what am I going to do? Clueless. I'll even take it to what we're doing right now, sitting here. Me and Casey tell the story. We rehearsed to practice to see if we could do it, and we thought our friendship was over. <laughs> I swear to God, <laughs> we were so bad, and it was like they this won. is. This is going to be a mistake. And actually, when I look back at the very first show we did compared to now, you see the progress and you see, okay, I had to keep doing it to get better at it. So I totally get what you're saying. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I always say, I always tell Mike, one of my favorite lines of my kids were there to say, say the same thing. You can't teach experience. You have to take action and you have to go. And that's why I think the mental tools are so important. Al, just a quick note about Harvey Dorfman. Like the stuff that he taught me is so much the stuff that he taught you. And I, I look at moments in my life and you were talking about that game where you went, seven scoreless and you felt like you didn't have your great stuff. I remember in the 2006 World Series, and I've told this story before, but it's worth telling without here. 2006 World Series, it's game five. Adam Wayne right on the mound. He's throwing 98 miles an hour with a nasty hook and a good changeup. On the second out, I would, I would have been the second out of the game five in the ninth. So they're two outs away from World Series title. We're down two runs, nobody on base. Uh, Wainwright throws me a first pitch heater. I swing and miss. Next pitch change up. I swing and miss. Has me 0-2. I step out of the box. The, 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 the crowd is so deafening. It is so loud. And I remember thinking to myself, wow, is that loud? Like, I had a moment where I was like, man, where, where am I? Like, this is so loud, right? But I remember it was like all that training of all these years of, of, of conversations with Harvey. No. Control what I can control. Get back and breathe or die. Get back into your breath. And I took, I remember taking two breaths there to get back in that moment, get back in the moment, get back in the box, get back into, into this one-on-one battle with Wainwright. Well, I remember gathering myself, getting back to my process, slowing myself down. I got back in the box out. Well, I tell you what, this crowd is still going nuts. All of a sudden, I don't hear them. Really? I just see Wainwright. And I think to myself, Harvey used to have me write three things on a note card. See the ball, be easy, and hammer it. Those are the three things I said. So I had that in my pocket, right? Yeah. And I would look at it on the on-deck circle. So I got back in the box. I looked back and I said, all right, I'm hunting the fastball. See the ball, hammer it, right? I get back to 3-2. Sure enough, the 3-2 the pitch, he throws me a 97 mile hair. Bam, I hit a rocket off the fence, double, right? We end up losing the game, lose the World Series. But I go back to that at bat. And that's when I say thank you so much to Harvey Dorfman. And reading this book when I was 16 years old, my dad got it for me and I just happened to, you know, kind of stumbled on it. Without those, that knowledge, I never even would have been in the big leagues or the World Series or a 300 hitter or the chance to do the things I did. So I know how strong the mind is and being able to live in the moment, focus on the task at hand is a skill mm-hmm. and it's to be worked on every day. And that moment, I look back, one of the coolest moments of my career. So good. And and uh, I'll, I'll bring you on this, Chinch. What, did, did Kay say anything about uh, 
Oh my God! Don't mess up! Don't strike out here! No, yeah, uh, all positive. Uh, what am I gonna do? Uh, what's he gonna do? What? No, he said, "See the ball." I can do that. Pick up the ball. Uh, be smooth. What did he say? Be easy. See the ball. Be easy. Be easy. So not like yeah. you know, sawdust the, the bat, and then 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 smash it. Yeah. 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 Like that. Was, that's all. Like that's so beautiful. It's, like, right? it's simplifying things, but also taking out the self doubt out of it. I guess is what you guys are. Same with this well, that's stuff, right? true. That yeah, <laughs> yeah. the whole like I, I, I uh, d- like hope is not a word. Um, even try. I mean, we could pull in uh, our, our our buddy Leland. Yeah. Try, try. I get my damn landscaper to try. I don't <laughs> try. What do? <laughs> awesome. I don't know if he pulled that on your on your oh. podcast. Oh yeah, oh yeah. not yeah. that, but he pulled that to me in my career. You know, I'm trying out <laughs> there. I get a truck. He said, I get a truck driver out here to try. Oh, uh, <laughs> he is. Nice. Hey, he, I guess when up in Detroit he was saying truck driver, but in Florida he was saying landscaper. <laughs> <laughs> so great, dude. Oh, it's so great, man. So, Al, let's switch gears, bro. Let's get back to you. Let's get down the road. Um, you get drafted by the Yankees. You, like you said, you grind a little bit through the minor leagues, but you finally get called up. And I, I one of the stories I want to, I have interest in is Billy Martin was your manager, right? My first full year, Billy Mort was a manager. Your first full year. Can you talk about what he was like and and how? What was the feeling for you getting called up to the biggest with the Yankees? With you know, was was there so much fear there? Uh, yeah, fear and doubt. Uh, scared. When I say I was scared to death in my first uh, big league start in uh, September sixteenth uh, of uh, nineteen eighty seven. So so this is when George was raging, right? There was a, like a different manager, like all yeah. the time. So when I got called up, Lou Pinello was the manager. Uh, he fired Lou at the end of the year, and he made Billy Martin the manager for like the fifth time. And initially, I thought it was the coolest thing, right? I'm going to yeah. spring training, legendary Billy Martin. You hear all the stories. All I knew is that I'm staying away from this guy because I'm, you know, I don't want to be the marshmallow man <laughs> or, or, or Ed Whitson, you know. <laughs> I don't want to have a So he, he liked me, you know, whatever. I was the young up-and-coming next guy, right? Uh, but clearly an interesting generational separation. First of all, like Leland, uh, and I don't know who, where he got it from, but maybe he got it from Billy because Billy was in Detroit. Um, he wore cleats. What manager wore – and I'm not talking about the plastic ones. I'm talking about metal cleats. Spikes, spikes high, yeah. Yeah. So, Titch, you're walking in the dugout. You look at your manager, and he's like 85 years old. He's wearing cleats. You're like, yeah, and he was like 85 pounds at the time too. So that's funny. Yeah. It's a funny image. So um, – but – he he it was just it was so generational and i think he was intimidating and respected because he was billy martin and i and i was on a i you know my first year in the big leagues in that rotation this is funny because I, I i told jack that i was in the rotation with tommy john this was years ago and he's like tommy john he's the person he's not the surgery oh my god like, really oh, yeah, no, oh, holy yeah. yeah no but i but i'm saying like this is this is years ago when i say the rotation was me Richard Dotson, Rick Roden, John Candelaria, Tommy John. I remember. I clearly. Wait a minute here. This is cool. I, I don't have a dig me room, but I do have this photo. <laughs> I love it. This guy's the best. It's just for everybody at home. Al has just left the picture. He's in his office. He's got champagne in his so office. So He's got a glow. I'll be honest. I don't have much. Yeah. Wow. I lights are really bad. Um... <laughs> So I don't have much. So this is going to look kind of whatever. You guys can think what you want, but I don't have much. This was the first rotation in my uh, – can you see that? Oh, yeah, yeah I, I can see it. See it. Yep. Send, send yep. me a picture of that too, and I'll put it You're on, on the our, left, our YouTube. Rick Roden. Look at that. The candy All right, man. So you got John Candelaria, uh, Richard Dotson, Tommy John, Rick Roden, and me. Wow. wow. This is my first rotation, you guys. Are you kidding me? <laughs> wow. <laughs> Tommy John was like 50. Candy was like late thirties. Dot was probably early thirties. He was uh, Richard. Uh, uh, Rick Roden was late thirties, and it was me. I'm like twenty one yeah. years old. Oh my god! So gosh. I came into that. But here I, in my office, I have two things. This was my first rotation, and this was my last start in the big leagues. Wow! wow look at that. And I have it right next to each other. So I'm cool. walking out, and you never know when your last last is. Yeah. This is in Oakland. I'd like totally pooped the bed. Here's Joe Torre coming out, and I got Posada, 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 Arod, Cano. You got Giambi a little bit back there, but that was that was wow. the last. So my first 
this in my last and I put it up on the wall. That's, that's cool. awesome. That's awesome. That's awesome. That's yeah. Like, wasn't there, was there some sort of mound visit? I kind of remember you telling me that he came out to the mound and just destroyed you one day, Billy Martin. Oh, am I, am I... oh Billy Martin. Yeah. So, I mean, the go-to for his pitching coach, Art Fowler, was, it was funny. He'd come out. He was like a big old guy from North Carolina, and something was going on. But it was his way of diffusing, you know, the tension. He's like, oh, man, man, what are you doing? What are you doing? I'm like, I, I don't know. You tell me. He's like, you got good stuff. You got good stuff. Just put the ball over the plate. And I'm looking at him like, no shit. He goes, I know one thing. He goes, I don't know one thing, but I know one thing. You're pissing Billy off. And he turns around, he walks away. And whoever the pitching, whoever the catcher was, I had Rick Cerrone, I had jo- uh, Don Slott. Um, Matt Noakes, Joel Skinner, maybe Skinner. Whatever. Yeah, Joel Skinner. And we would just look at each other. Like, there was no, like, hey, get your arm up. Close, you, know, follow. you got good stuff. Put the ball over the plate. No, here it was. Uh, so, Chinch, uh, that year in 88, I, I hadn't had a win in a few starts. I, I started out like 4-0, and then I, I, it was like really dry, whatever. I forget, either pitching poorly or, or – and it was Monday Night Baseball when they had Monday Night Baseball guys yeah, on ABC, yeah, yep. which yeah. maybe people out there are like, big deal, what's oh, a big that deal? Was no, the, that was the biggest were, thing in a world. The biggest thing in a world because we didn't have baseball. We, yeah. All the games weren't televised. Right. They, we, didn't have all the, right. we didn't have all that. No, that was it. No, it's Saturday game of the week with uh, with Joe Garagiola. If your team was on there, that was cool. And the Yankees, yeah. we, were, we were on a lot. Right. And then Monday Night Baseball with uh, – it was Jim Palmer and uh, – who did, was it uh, – was it Cal- – was Coach Sell still alive? I don't, I don't know. know. Co- well, wasn't it uh, – what's his name? Uh, Going to be Al a Michaels? barn burner. Uh, no, no the football Al, My- or, uh, Al Jackson, yeah. Uh, Jackson. Yeah. Anyway, so, Jackson. so it's in Tiger Stadium – uh, the Tigers were good, right? So they were, you know, whatever. They came off, well, 84. But, um, and uh, Gary Ward hits a grand slam. And I'm beat, Jack Morris is pitching. And I'm pitching against Jack Morris. And I get a blister. I used to get a blister really oh, bad. Right. Mr. Blister. And it was the start of my – because everything came off the seam, right? So at four seam, my cutter, I really, really pulled down on the cutter. I really pulled down on a curveball. Didn't have a two-seamer. And my changeup stunk. So, like, it was always, like, friction, right? So, I'm literally – the pad on here was like an oval racetrack on my middle finger, and it was – the skin peeled off, and, like, people have blisters before, right? And it's bleeding, but it's dripping uh, blood, right? So, uh, it's two outs in the fifth inning. Chet Lemon is up, and I'm patting my leg to just figure out a way to get one more out to get the W. And uh, Gene Monahan, I guess our trainer, noticed, like, I have a blotch of blood on my <laughs> leg. Tiger Stadium, dugout, old Tiger Stadium, oh. on, the, on the first baseline. And Billy comes, time out, he comes walking out, and, oh, my God, Chinch, did he rip me a new one. <laughs> you dumb son of a bop, 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 what? And I'm looking at him, he's this big. I'm like, oh, shit, I hope he doesn't punch me right now. <laughs> <laughs> so... Because of that and, the you know, the, the, the silliness of a blister, it literally – I was on the DL for like two months. Oh, my God. Because it's one of those things where, yeah, you yeah. know, you oh, yeah, I feel good. I'm coming back. And then all of a sudden it heats up. You know, that bullshit. Right, sure. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, Billy did not punch me. and uh, <laughs> I, Al, really quick, I know you were up there a little bit, but Mattingly was like my idol. Did you, did you get a chance to like kind of like – Feel the mystique of Donnie baseball. Oh my God. You talk a legend, right? So, you know, and again, this, it was, it was, it was, it was strange for me a little bit because I grew up a Mets fan growing up in New Jersey. My dad loved the lovable losers. He loved Casey Stengel and he actually liked the Mets because they were, they lost and they were the underdog. underdog. And my dad didn't actually like them. My dad was born in Manhattan, but my dad didn't like the Mets or the Yankees because they won all the time. Like how, Mm -hmm. you know, opposite of what everybody else right so i then i i sign I, I i get drafted by the yankees i sign and then three years out of high school i'm pitching at yankee stadium huh. my debut i got rick Cerrone, i got don manningly at first willie randolph at second uh bobby meacham at third pags and at, at, or uh, bobby meacham at short pags at third winfield at right henderson at left and yeah. quad washington wow. yeah one wow. of the best offensive teams the yankees had in the 80s. yeah go ahead sorry 
Yeah, no, we, I mean, they were, they, were, they were brand names, right? Hall of Fame guys. But Donnie, one thing that stood out, Case, was even with Billy Martin and certainly with Lou Pinella and Dallas Green, which was my last manager with the Yankees in 89, Don Manningly would take over infield bunt, bunt place in spring training. It was cool. I'm telling you, Case, I, I, you know, you could appreciate this being the first baseman. They would just refer to Donnie. Hey, Donnie, what do you want to do on the wheel play? Hey, Donnie, where do you want the pitchers on the one play? Donnie, what do you think they should do on the two play? So, you know, I'm sitting here as a young guy. And, of course, it's Don Mattingly, great hitter, you know, batting champ and all that. But he took over infield bunt plays for, for you know, I mean, Billy, of course, had to say. But they would, they would refer to – Donnie, like he was clearly that guy, you know, I mean, that, that's so cool. That's so cool to hear. And like, humble too. Donnie, yeah. Donnie, Donnie's a, like a Midwest Indiana boy, humble as can be, um, you know, great guy, great yeah. guy. God, I, I know, man. When first time I ever met him, I'm like, I had him sign a bat for me in spring training and the pen didn't work. I'm like, Oh my God, the pen doesn't work. And like, it like, it was like that, you know, it was like the silver pen, paint pen. And like, he wrote Don Mattingly and it kind of like just smudged it. I'm like, yeah. thanks a lot, man. I appreciate it. whatever is on here. At least I can say it was you that yeah. wrote it. You know, <laughs> you know it was him. I know, was it was that him, the, yeah. uh, was, wait, I think you told us that story. Was that, was that the Hitman poster that was around? Oh, yeah. The- yeah. All oh, the Hitman poster was in. Yeah. And then I would come back and stay with my parents whenever we play the Pirates. I go in, bam, there's the Hitman poster still, still on my wall. <laughs> right. I was like, Let's go. That one, that one was right next to Farrah Fawcett, right? <laughs> yes, it was perfect. Two of my interests, two of my biggest <laughs> interests. <laughs> um, so, Al, you also talk a lot about Dave Rigetti and, yeah. and, and what Rags, you know, you know, meant to you, you know, as, a, as not only as a player, but as a, as a person. Could you talk about your relationship with him? So Rags uh, definitely took me under his, his wing. Uh, he saw similarity lefty, you know, hard thrower, you know, definitely I needed to be contained, uh, goofy, you know, curious, um, kind of bouncing all over the place. So rags, um, rags, rags, rags wanted to make sure that, that I, I behaved the way a, a big leaguer should. And like, to this day, like, I appreciate, like, I didn't appreciate or understand what he was doing while he was doing it. But now knowing at, over the years of my time in the big leagues and what I tried to impart on, say, the younger kid or the younger player, um, but just how to act. Yeah. And, you know, he'd give me that look once in a while or, you know, he, you know, he put me in my place. And it was all very benign, like playful stuff. But like I understood what he was doing. And the biggest thing, Case, and you can appreciate this because I don't know who the, that player was on your team yeah. as far as the guy Barry, that was Barry fighting. Larkin, Barry Larkin. Barry Larkin was I. I didn't want to disappoint Rags. I, like I wanted him. I guess I wanted him to like me, but I also wanted to. I wanted to behave and do what he was trying to teach. If that makes sense. Yeah. And and Rigetti, the lineage here, because I got a chance to play with Ron Guidry as well. Um, the the lineage of. Sparky Lyle Gator to Rags to me. I mean, that was kind of what at that time they were hoping that I was going to be kind of the next lefty thing, you know, um, injury and whatever went sideways and then I get traded. But so I knew, I knew that because I knew when Rags talked so, so nice and, and, and had a, a affinity for, uh, for Sparky Lyle uh, and that kind of thing. And then here comes you know, other guys that, that, that via through Sparky to rag uh, to Gidry to Rigetti. I, I think, you know, we're, we're kind of like going in a lot of, it seems like we're going in a lot of different places, but we're saying the same thing that the, the fact of experienced players, experienced yes. people, we we're mentioning about, you got to go out and do it right. Right. That in the game, and I hope it doesn't get there, but the value of that, I don't even want to say journeyman because it sounds like a guy who's hanging on, but the value of that player and, and Chinch, maybe you could start blurting out some players in the last five, seven, eight years yeah. that you keep that guy around because oh, it's right. more than what he, who Albert, Albert Pujols right now, where, wherever he was, wherever he's going oh, yeah, the yeah, next, year, you know, like, next, next level stuff. But right. uh, 
boy, I'm, I'm blanking right now, but I, I can't say the enough. Jambi's last if, three years in the big leagues. He barely uh, he barely picked up a Jay, bat, but Jay, they needed Jay, him on those Jay teams. Sutley. Chase Sutley. Chase Sutley in L.A. Yeah, yeah. yeah you're right. So, so we, you know, to, like that, it's more than just the pinch hit or an occasional no. start. It's, it's, it's having that voice and that experience around the kid. Yeah. who needs to feel that legacy of ca- taking the baton and passing it to the next right. guy. And Jeter got it from his guy in 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 in, in uh, Don Manny. Don Manny. Like, and, it was so... Yeah, I'll yeah. take it a step, step further because I, I can relate this to, to just, you know, people who don't play the sports, but it's the same concept. I always say, like, when I started getting into, like, managerial roles and there are people underneath you, I've learned, like, you know, there's a whole Machiavellian thing, right, where it's like... Uh, Better to be feared than loved, whatever. I, I always say one of the biggest things is you don't want, like, your employees or, you know, the young player with the old player. The, the the biggest sign of a good leader is you want people that aren't going to be scared that you're going to get mad at them. You want them to be upset if they disappointed you. And what you said that about, about Rigetti, like, a leader, a good leader is one that really literally, like, you just want to do your best for them because you know that that leader has your back and you know that they're teaching you all the things you need to be a better person or a better player and all that yeah. stuff. So I love I love that point you made. Yeah, yeah. It, I mean, it, it's it's kind of that quandary of a, of a parent. And I see a lot of parents that want to be friends and pals with their kids as opposed to you're still the father. Like, you have to be a father once in a while. And, you know, fathers have to say things and put your kid back in their place. And, uh, you know, there's some tough love at times. And, right. you know, that's okay. And that's like, why it's good to have that 38-year-old player who's at the tail of his, right. end of his career with the 22-year-olds. And there's 20 of them there, right? Yeah. Yep. Well, I know I know one father figure, if he was still alive, would be pissed off right now that he traded Al Leiter to the Blue Jays. And that's George Steinbrenner. Because I don't think that – I'm just saying <laughs> – I know Jesse Barfield was a great player, but at that time they traded a young outlier who ended up having an unbelievable career for Jesse Barfield, who was on the way out. So George right now is listening to this right now and going, man, we never should have traded outlier. What are we nuts? Um, so bro. So that you get traded from the Yankees to the blue Jays. And I think this is when, you know, the evolution of outlier, you finally come off those injuries, though, the blisters, all the things that happened, a couple surgeries. And now you're with, now you're with the blue Jays. Um, what, what, what happened Al? What, what, what was it mentally, physically that, that took you to another level there in Toronto? So I, I, I finally got healthy. I have, I had two shoulder operations. What, what was identified after the trade was that I was pitching with, um, with a, with a bum arm, but mostly, uh, uh, there's a thing, atrophy of the infraspinatus. The infraspinatus is a decelerator. It's in your, it's in your subscapula. Uh, there, there's nerve impingement that has muscles, uh, atrophy, atrophies. So as a result, I didn't have a very important rotator cuff muscle that would keep the humerus from not popping out of the joint. But once I identified what it was, and then having a couple time, uh, t- couple shoulder surgeries by Dr. Andrews, I was able to strengthen all of the other muscles to complement something I didn't have. So it really became me identifying what the hell was going on. Wow. Uh, but it was also a lot of uh, soul searching epiphany moments because I thought my career was done. I, I was up at the uh, September of 87. I was up in 88 and 89. I get traded and I get hurt. So I'm 20, I'm 23 years old. I have my first surgery. I have my second surgery at 25. And there was a lot of hit and miss going through those years. Like you look at my, you look at my baseball reference. I did nothing until, you know, 93 was my coming out party. It was really 92. I was a big league pitcher in Syracuse in 92, but we were such a badass team. We won the World Series. We beat the Braves that year. Yeah. I got called up in September. and was like on the taxi squad wow. and just uh, watched. But I, I pitched an inning at the end of the year in 92. Yeah. For, but um, that season, just so I had the numbers real quick. It's 14 games in 1988, 89-5, then four with Toronto. You really didn't pitch more than nine games a year for those few years. Uh that you were coming back. Yeah. I mean, it, it, uh, when I hear guys and especially the sports saying, you know, guys in their late twenties or, you know, hitting 30, they're like, they're on their back nine, get the hell out of here. There's no way. Some of my best stuff that I, that I pitched, I was in my early mid thirties. I was, I, I was, I just, I, so when I hear that, I, I don't buy that. The only thing that will stop a, a guy today is that he's not motivated to either uh, make another world, another all-star game, win a world series, or try to make the hall of fame because they made too much money. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not knocking it, but 
guys were grinding it out for years. Yes, they loved the game, but they were also needed the they needed the paycheck. And yeah. before me, uh, right. you know, so now you got guys. You know, they they sign a five or six year deal. They hit thirty one to thirty two. They've made one hundred and twenty five million. That they t- they take it to the house. Yep. You know, so good for them. But like, no, there's plenty left in in the in the in the thirty two to thirty six year old player easily. Take us back. Oh, here, to that. I'm sorry, Case. Go I didn't ahead. answer. Go ahead. So, but here, so I finally get healthy. But back to this dude. I met Harvey Dorfman in 1991, and it changed my mental game. And that was the transformation of me understanding and identifying what my job was. So, yeah, I and I, and I was so free and easy at that time in my baseball life to admit to this of what was going on in between my ears that helped transform me into being. A, a good pitcher, a tough pitcher, mentally tough. Yeah. You know, get on the mound. I'm battling you. Sean Casey's a hell of a hitter, but okay, let's hey, go. Let's get it on. Let's get it on. Whatever great player. I, I actually – I enjoyed facing the better hitters in lineups. It sounds a little crazy. The guys that got me often were the dude that like was batting seventh or eighth, and all of a sudden he pops a double down the line. I'm like, damn. You know, <laughs> what? You know, I don't want to mention names, but, like, you get through, like, you know, Bonds and Kent and whoever, and then all of a sudden some dude, like – whack he's like what right but i i elevate it to like okay tony gwynn's batting right now all right or you know pick your pick your brand name guy through the 80s and 90s and how, how did how did you attack tony gwynn i want to hear this so tony I, I i wasn't worried about left on left of hit a hit him hitting a home run um so my feeling was is that i tried to come in enough to keep the ball away and hopefully hit it at somebody i promise you case he hit the scatter report of pitching coaches and the analytics and all the all the stuff that goes on is that he's going to put the ball in play. Well, you didn't strike out much either. Did you ever strike out a hundred times in the season? No, never. No, 80, well, 80, I struck out eighty one year, is it? Yeah. So you're you're in the you're in the same mold, dude. You really are. But you know, Tony took it to another level. Guy could bet, I think he could have batted four hundred that uh, the one year. Ninety four, yeah. Yeah, ninety four. Uh he just he's gonna put it in play and hopefully hits it somebody. That was it. If he hit it, if there was nobody on base, it was get the two guys out in front of him. He's going to hit it to the five and a half hole. Hopefully we're in the right position. We throw him out. Yeah. Honestly. Yeah. Like, and I was okay with that. If, if Tony Gwynn was two for three, you know, a couple singles and, you know, you beat the Padres five, two, like, all right, you know, that was a great game. He was yeah. 10, about, 10 about, for 22, about, 10 for 22 for a 455 batting average. But to your point, three doubles, one homer and Two ribbies in your entire career against him. So that's exactly what you're saying. Yeah. Like, you know, what year did now. he have the homer? When? I don't remember. Oh, that. I don't know. I'm not a real researcher. This well, is just a okay, half well, I, 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 I want to. St- Al, I want to stay in your mind here as a pitcher, really quick. Bonds. How'd you face Bonds? Oh, yeah. BB. So BB, uh, totally on the plate, choked up a little bit. You talk about plate coverage was was so. He was so close to the plate that there was no way something out or third that he wasn't going to get barrel on it. So did he? Did he? Did he, elim- did he eliminate your cutter? Because you I mean your cutter was your bread and butter. Now you know he could take that pitch middle away and hammer it. I didn't throw him a cutter. I, I went fastballs in, big curveballs, and the bigger, the bigger, and the, the 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 bigger vertical I could get, and the slower but still not baby it was the best. I went hard, hard in all the time, preferably up. He had a little window inside, very small on the plate inside. He didn't like the ball in. He had the big pad, if you remember. Yeah. Yep. Um, but it was hard because the window, left on left window, it's it's hard visual to see the batter here. And then I'm trying to, I'm trying to go body line without hitting him. Yeah. Right. Um, but yeah, that, that was it. But I, I, I how did Barry do? Did Barry Three get hundred. me? He got me no. when I first Two two bombs, but honestly, technically for Barry Bonds, you had great success at, off of him. He hit three hundred. He was nine for thirty, but two triples probably when he was young, and two homers, but really nothing. Five RBIs. That's good against Bonds. Only four walks, and he struck him out six times. I mean, you pretty much that's dominating Barry Bonds when when he was playing. <laughs> you know, I, I'm going to call BS on the second home run. I think he only hit one home run. I mean, I right. I'll it's, call the reference. We got, bad, we got bad research in the mayor's office. We got no, because I, I mean, there are certain guys that, and, and probably for you too, Case, when you face that uh, that yeah. certain pitcher. But Barry, I, I, you know, there's not a whole lot of guys I remember a lot of the bats, but Barry Bonds hit a low liner my first year in the National League in 1996, came over from Toronto to the, to the Marlins at the old candlestick and hit like a line drive into the, uh, you know, like they had the uh, 
the stands that 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 accordion back when the 49ers were playing. I don't know if you yeah, guys yeah. ever been. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was. I played there. I played there. Yeah. So he ripped it into those to to those uh, oh. you know right over the wall. <laughs> but I don't remember uh, two homers, huh? That's yep. what it says. They could be wrong. People says. are wrong. It says <laughs> so. So Al. You win, your, you win your first World <laughs> Series that year in 93 with, with, the, with the Blue Jays. And, you know, this is when you really did well. You did well in the postseason. It was your first, you know, time getting after it. Um, you know, I go back and look at that lineup of Tony Fernandez, Roberto Alomar, Dave Winfield, Paul Mauder, Devon White, Joe Carter, John Olerud, Ricky Henderson. Almost ridiculous, that lineup top to bottom. Um, Kelly Gruber. Kelly Gruber, you know. What was that like for you being such a big part of that team that wins it all? Toronto. So um, it was fulfilling to say the least, because, uh, you know, after getting called up at the end of September, uh, I was not part of the postseason roster in 92, but still the experience of being in, you know, in an organization that was going in the right direction. So 93, I started and relieved. Um, and uh, it was uh, Stottlemyre uh, ended up being uh, the top four starters uh, for the postseason. Todd, Todd Stottlemyre, uh, we had, uh, a young Pat Henkin who came on. Right. Um, we had Jack Morris, Dave Stewart. We we had we had Juan, a Juan Guzman. Yeah, Guzman was another guy that came on. I think Jimmy Key had left to go to the Yankees, and might have still had Dave Steve, uh, who was hurt. Yeah, it was amazing. So Cone, right? Wasn't um, Cone a hired gun? David Cone. Yeah, well, Cone came over in '92. Yeah, right. and then he came back in '95. Right. And then we traded him to uh, the Yankees that year. Yeah. They went on to. Uh, well, yeah, that was the year that they they almost uh, yeah. right they yeah. lost to Seattle. Right, right, exactly. So, so you, you so so from Toronto, from Toronto though, um, you end up you end up going to the Marlins, and in 1996, correct? 1996. Right. You know, and you throw the first ever no hitter for the Marlins, and it, you know, looking back at your numbers too, um, you know, pretty impressive what you did in 1996. Six, 293 RA, over 200 punch outs. It's your first All Star game. But I want to talk about that no hitter and what that was like pitching a no hitter and the old question like when did you realize you had it and yeah. what were you feeling in the ninth? Yeah, so the ninth I definitely felt like you know that, that you know I'm I'm going to throw this no hitter I'm going to do everything possible. So it was weird. Uh, I faced um, we we had a big lead uh, early on. So it was it was it was in May. Uh, I don't know what the attendance was, but there, there was a hockey game. The owner of the Marlins, uh, Wayne Huizinga, also on the Panthers, and they were in the uh, the finals, in the uh, Eastern Conference finals against the Flyers. So in between every inning, you talk about how crazy it is. And you've been to the old stadium, right? So, <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, it was a nice crowd, but nothing crazy. Right. In between the innings of this no-hitter, they were going to live look-ins oh, on the God, jumbo the truck of the Panthers and the, and the Flyers. <laughs> So I'm not thinking anything early in the game. So boom, boom, boom. We get a big lead. Uh, I know early in the game, I walked somebody and I hit Ellis Burks. And Larry Rothschild, who's a pitching coach, he took me underneath. And I love Larry. Love Larry. Andres Galarraga. You, you walked Galarraga to start the end. Okay, Galarraga. Yeah, so I'm kind of doing my my usual, like, that, 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 you know, walk, you know. <laughs> and so Larry kind of jumps me. And I'm like, take it easy, man. Like, I got, you know, like, whatever. I don't know what I said, but something goofy. And that was, like, from the third inning on. And then it just started flowing. And and this is going to sound like like BS, but there wasn't anything that, you know, there's always a no-hitter where you go, oh, my God, you know, what a play. Or, oh, my God, the, some something about it. It was about the most boring, benign no-hitter. I hate to say it. <laughs> Uh, you know, just like just little pop ups and broken bat this and that. So about halfway through the game, I think about the sixth inning, the Marlins people putting on this live look in of the freaking Panthers playing the Flyers. <laughs> They're like, wait a minute, we got a no hitter here. We got to get people to like focusing back on our our game. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so the last I always say this and, 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 you know, certainly being on air when it was like, oh, you know, alert, 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 right. you know. Rich Chimino in San Diego's got a no hitter. I'm like, uh, what? Fifth yeah, yeah, inning. It's not happening. <laughs> no, seventh inning. And I tell you why it's the seventh. If you get through the seventh for a lot of reasons, now you need only six outs. But if you have a perfect game in the seventh inning, you're pitching to one, two, three, right? You got the, the, the top three guys in a perfect game. If you walk a guy, you're pitching two, three, four. If you walk two guys, you're pitching three, four, five. 
So that was me. In the seventh inning, I pitched three, four, five. Uh, you know, they had a Colorado was good. What that was ninety six. They came off a yeah. playoff team. Oh, you're talking about Dante yeah. Bichette, yeah. Ellis Burke, Bichette, Vinny Castilla. Vinny Castilla, big time lineup. Big time lineup. Yeah, but it was Larry, Larry Walker too, right? Yeah, I think Larry Walker. I don't think he no, was he in that. With the Expos, still, he was still with the Expos. I think no, no ninety five. Was he? Okay. I'll pull it up. By the way, eighth inning, three pitches. Eighth inning, three pitches. Al, is that true? How about that? Is that? That's crazy. Would you do that? Good, in a, good in a job five on nothing offense game? there. <laughs> or 11 nothing, Chinch. They started swinging at the first pitch. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> oh, my God. 11 nothing in the eighth. So Eric Young, Eric Young is the last batter. And I'm like, and Charlie Johnson's in there. You know, I threw a lot of cutters, a bit less back then, but, and, I was like, no way. I'm going fastball away every time. If this dude goes right field, grounder, whatever. But And it was just – and I don't know how many it was. He kept fouling him off, fouling him off, fouling him off, and then he swung through it. And, uh, yeah, awesome. I, I, I think – you know, it's weird because, like, again, the whole no-hit thing. I, I never really thought – I mean, you dream about it, but I never thought, like, oh, yeah, I got no-hit stuff today. Like, never. Like, I – no hit stuff today means what? You leave a ball up and the guy pops it out. It's like, you know, it's – but once I did it, I'll be lying to you guys if I said, like, I didn't think, man, that would be cool if i do it again. And the main <laughs> thing was is that I was so lame at the last out. He Charlie comes out to me. He hugs me. I hung him. Oh, it was yeah, like, yeah. He just shook everybody's hand. Like, if you didn't yeah. know any better, you would have figured it was like yeah. a dude who just threw, like, a shutout, yeah. gave up, like, one or two runs. Funny. I, didn't know what to do. I said, man, if I ever throw another no hitter, man, I wish I would. I'd go nuts. I'm going nuts. Yeah. <laughs> well, at least your, your, kid, so your kid did it for you. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> that yeah. Awesome. That's true. So, so 97, brother, I think, you know, you talk about that 93 team in Toronto, man, where you loaded 97 in Florida. Well, let's go down just for a second. Charles Johnson, Jeff Conine, Craig, uh, council, Renteria, uh, uh, Gary Sheffield, Moise Salou, Devon White, Bobby Bonilla. Then you had Kevin Brown, you, Alex Hernandez, LeVon Hernandez, and Rob Nen closing, who was filthy. <laughs> right, who was filthy. Dude, take us back to that team and, you know, what that was like. And also, when it was all said and done against the Indians, Jim Leland, my favorite manager of all time, one of the best managers in the history of the game, hands out lighter the ball to take for game seven. Just take us through especially that run. What was it like getting the ball for game seven and that team, you know, walking it off in Florida and, 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 the, and the pandemonium that ensued? Amazing. And I, I'm going to throw in, I can't believe it, I say the late Darren Dalton, uh, but we wow. traded, for, right. we traded for Dutch at the trade deadline. And he was the kind of the final elixir to team chemistry. Not that we had a bad problem, but like he was a dude. Like, I don't know if you ever encountered with, with Darren Dalton. Yeah, but, I did. Yeah, I did. It's awesome guy. Yeah, and like the presence was like, uh, we needed this. Uh, so, yeah, it, I, I'll be like, it, it was a weird quandary. We're we're up three to two. Our ace is on the mound. I'm charting because I'm going to pitch. If there is a game seven, Kevin Brown, who was amazing, uh, like just amazing. Like every game seemed like he was either shut out or almost a shutout. And their fourth starter, I guess I don't know. Chad OJ, nice pitcher, really yep, good yep, sinker. Yep. And he shoves like I, you know, I think Brownie gave up a couple, you know, we didn't score, but I'm sitting there. I'm like, I, I was fighting myself cause I, I'm charting and I'm like, you know, I'm looking and like thinking like there's a game tomorrow, but then part of it, I was like, <laughs> I hope there isn't a game, but then yeah. there was a piece of me saying, man, wouldn't that be pretty cool pitch a game seven? Like just doesn't happen that much. Oh, it's but then I'm like, no, no, no. <laughs> no, I want to. I don't want to pitch a game seven because I want to go jump on a dog pile and not <laughs> not worry about that. You know the, the headache and pressure of it. So when we lost, I completely got into like, okay, you know, game mode. I gotta, you know, I gotta do my thing. And one of the things I did was I looked at my game four and typical like my my crappy games were spraying the ball walking some dudes, you know, here comes like a ball up in the zone, a guy hits a double, you score three, you know, two guys on base, you walk like that, you know, that's your tempo. You, even now we watch a game. Like if a guy has a bad yeah. game, there's always like two soft spots in the lineup where you just like, you just kind of lose it. That was me. Uh, but I, I looked at two guys in the, uh, I guess it was their LCS or maybe it was their division series, Andy Pettit and David Wells. 
Mm. Andy Pettit got hit around by the Indians. And the Indians, they had a hell of a lineup that year. Loaded, case. Yeah. They were loaded. Sandy, I mean, I got, Sandy I got was the MVP. Up to, I, got called up, I got called up to that team in 97. I got I got sent out to the Arizona Fall League, but I was on that team in September, and they were loaded. Yeah, yeah that, was, that, was a, that was a hell of a lineup. I mean, there was no soft spot. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I guess Fiscal batting eighth, I guess, or ninth was, or whatever. But he was still really good. Almost had yeah. 3,000 hits. Yeah. You know? Actually, he led off. What am I talking about? Here. So – uh, I looked at both of them and I said, in order for me to not crap the bed, I gotta, I gotta do something different. And I was, you know, power fastball, power slider, power cutter, occasional backdoor curveball, very occasional a changeup. And I was like, I need to, I need to do something different. So I told Larry Rocha, I said, first pitch of the game is gonna be a curveball. I need to establish I'm throwing freaking curveballs and I'm throwing a bunch of them because these guys are gonna, they're gonna be on my, they're gonna be on me. So Larry's like, well, we'll look at the lineup. We'll look. I was like, no, I don't give a shit who's up. Nice. I'm throwing first pitch of the game curveball because I need my own brain to say, get that out. You're going to need it. So I'm warming up. I get to my curveball. We're down the right field line at Pro Player Stadium. And I'm, I literally bounced almost every curveball. They're down, <laughs> they had a rubber tarp. I don't know if you knew this case, but they had like rubber on the, on the ground. And I kept it kept skipping up into the stands. Like I threw like I threw like nine balls into the stands while I'm warming up. First pitch of the game, Eddie Montague's behind the plate. Omar Vizquel, Charlie Johnson, boom. And I'm telling you, it was like one of those perfect little boom. And Eddie Monty goes, drag. Mm. And I'm telling you, there's seven. They peeled off every tarp at that stadium. There was like, I don't know, it felt like 105,000, but there was yeah. a, a ton of people there. I don't know what the attendance was, but it was a lot. Um, and it was like, it was case. I'm telling you, it was like one of those, oh, okay. And I, and I brought it out. And I remember throwing a bunch to Dave Justice and a bunch to Matt Williams and, and, and Manny Ramirez. Like, Wait, real quick. 67,204 people. In that game, it was bananas, man. I mean, if they could have put any more in there, yeah, because well, they have to peel the the stands back in left field, so they would have put, yeah, it was crazy. And uh, yeah, it was just like one of those things, man. Keep making pitches, and you're right, Leland, you know, gave me the ball. I mean, it was my day, uh, but because I wasn't great in game three, uh, you know, there was that, you know, where, where, where were you when Renteria got the hit? What dugout. Yeah. Were you in the yeah. dugout? Wow. Oh, yeah. No, that's not – you're not going inside to, you know, ice yeah. it down and have a couple of beers. <laughs> <laughs> well, I might have had a couple of beers, but <laughs> – In the dugout. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, next to Skip with his cigarette. <laughs> you feel like you're in a bar in New York at 2 a.m. with Skip smoking heaters. You're having a couple of beers, but you're watching a big league game. <laughs> oh, my God, dude. That what, what a moment that must have been for you. But as – you fast forward, they blow up that team. Wade Heisinger says, we're going to have a fire sale. We're getting rid of everybody. Everyone from that team goes. Dave Dombrowski's wheeling, dealing people. You end up with the Mets. Yeah. You end up back home. You end up with the team that you and your dad and your family rooted for growing up, and, and now you're back home. What did, what, was, what did that mean to you to go back to New York, especially Amazing. for the Mets? Amazing to the team you rooted for. And I uh, still had plenty left in the tank. I uh, what year? Uh, how old was I? Thirty? Was I thirty yet? How old was I? Eighty-seven. Yeah, no, it, was, it was ninety-eight. Ninety-eight. So I'm like thirty-three. Yep. Yep. Uh, Thirty-two. I, I thought it was pretty cool. So Dave Dombrowski calls me, and and we we knew they were unloading everybody, right? So he calls me, goes, "Look, I'm not promising you anything." He said, "But I have two comparable deals." Thirty-two. Do you have a preference? What? How old was I? Thirty-two. Yeah. Thirty-two. 32. So, yeah, there it is, 32. Uh, a year before I pitched against you, Case, and it should have given you 99, 100 RBIs. I, uh, so he says, I, I'm not promising you, but I have comparable deals, St. Louis Cardinals or the New York Mets. This was Dave Dombrowski. Wow. And I was like, you know, Case, that's pretty cool. When a, you know, the GM's calling you, he doesn't do that. Like, you know, I'm, that's awesome of him to do that. So I said, Dave, I said, man, I mean, I grew up a Mets fan. Like I, that would be amazing. You know, and it's in, it's in division, like, you know, whatever. Although the Marlins, you know, really went the other way for a few years uh, because of that. And sure enough, man, next day, uh, AJ Burnett was a A-ball pitcher with the Mets 
that went over oh, in that I didn't trade. Know that that was the yeah. AJ Burnett went over in that trade. Wow. wow. Yeah, yeah, AJ Burnett. Uh, there was a that about four or five guys. Um, yeah, so that was that was. You know, I guess you're a Pittsburgh. Were you a Pirate fan? Yeah, it's a huge Pirate fan. Huge Pirate yeah, fan. Yeah, so it'd be. Yeah, it'd be, you know, well, I played for Pittsburgh in '06 for a little bit, but it meant a lot to play there. It's like your dream, you know, your, your dream team as a kid. So. Totally. So for you with the Mets, but you you went there, brother. Not only did you go there, dominated. You end up dominating seventeen and six with a two four seven, and now the Mets are second in the NL East, eighty eight and seventy four. Um, you know, and then you end up, you know, oh, and Mike Piazza ends up coming. This is where yeah. I want to I want to talk about him a little bit because, you know, I not playing for the Mets. I've heard different things about Piazza as a teammate. You know, maybe he was a little moody, played with guys that come in. They're like, uh, don't talk to him today. He's a little moody. I'm like, all right, that's so tired. But, you know what I mean? I, I've heard different things about Piazza, but I know, you know, my relationship with you, I know you and Mike are friends, and you always had great things to say about Mike, Mike Piazza. Can you talk about him a little bit and, and, and just the figure he was in New York? You know, almost feel, it seemed like a cartoon figure. And, but more, more importantly, what was he like as a teammate? Yeah. So, look, I, I I appreciate it more after you play to realize the guys that took it so seriously, maybe to a detriment, and I don't know, maybe Mike would agree, would admit to it or not, but after the fact, when you get a guy that's so lasered locked in and being a catcher is more responsibility than – in, in this essence of winning that game and the responsibility than even a starting pitcher, because you're dealing with an entire staff, you're dealing with you, uh, you know, controlling behind the plate. And then he happened to be our best player. So now you become your best offensive player. It's a really odd, you know, how many teams have you ever played on where your catcher was your superstar best player? Right. I mean, I mean, maybe good point. Pudge, we, I play with Pudge a little bit, but he was okay, one of the best players. Yeah. Uh, maybe Posey. I don't know. Yeah. I, you know, not but maybe. not not to Mike's desk. So, like, he took he took that responsibility to a, a whole other level. So, I think when teammates or people or peripheral people, you know, didn't identify like this, the how much he really took, you know, a, really took on a bad game, a good game, a, you know, a loss, a win. Um, I lockered next to him for seven years. Like we were right here, right next to each other. And, um, you know, he, he was, he was a good teammate. He was, he gave a shit. He cared. Like you talk about high level of give a shit. Yeah. So uh, we would drive back to the city too. Like, uh, you know, cause I would either uh, we'd carpool cause he lived near me on the Upper East Side and, on, uh, you know, so I got to know him in, in, a, in a good way. And uh, you know, there was nobody, I would say this, and I played on good teams. We went through it, right? Toronto and, 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 and the Marlins with the World Series teams. No, none of my teammates uh, represented the, uh, as, as important of a player as Mike Piazza Wow! in all my years. And I say that not, not because of the other Hall of Fame guys that I played with, but it was about Mike. And, yeah, we had nice players around. Todd Zeal was a nice player. Robin Ventura was a nice player. John Olaru was a nice player. But Mike was like, he was rock star status. Yeah. So, you know, so you talk about the ultimate target on his back. And now it's like every night, and every day and the microphone in front of his face. And like, you know, he dealt like, so, you know, Case, you would have liked him. You would have liked yeah. him. He, he knew when to let his hair down. He knew when uh, the right off day to be able to go and, uh, you know, we'd go to karaoke and he liked like hair band stuff and like <laughs> Def Leppard and like some crazy nice. Metallica. The stuff you liked actually. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He was so into the heavy metal stuff. So, you know, and I appreciated that, you yeah. know, and he, and he gave a shit. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love playing against him. I love how hard he played. He played. So I remember talking to him at first base a couple of times. I'm like, man, I. Case, you're I, a big dude. You're a big dude, and you got big hands, big forearms. I'm telling you, and I'm not lying. He would take his fist, right hand, and punch cement walls. And I'm not talking about like a, like, boom. Oh my god! You're looking like, oh my god, what's he doing? He's out of his mind. He's out of his mind. 
And I'm like, Mike, stop. And like, he would, like, you know, he got knuckles that like kind of protrude a little bit. Yeah. 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 Like, he had like flat, like, like what? Stop. Oh my God. Yeah. So for, so for you and Piazza and all the boys, all that whole, that those teams, those Mets teams that now are really good. Um, what was that Subway series like in 2000? You guys versus the Yankees. You know, I, re- I remember watching it <clears throat> as a fan and saying, boy, that atmosphere is intense, it seems like. Yeah. So uh, amazing. Now back to I start with the Yankees. I'm on the back nine of my career. Uh, you know, I'm with the team that I rooted for as a kid. Uh, we beat the Cardinals in uh, in five. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, five. And we were waiting to find out whether we were going to Seattle or playing the Yankees. And I was 100%. I'm like, are you kidding me? I don't care the mighty Yanks or not. I so want to play the Yankees. Yeah. It was like 40-something years since the last real Subway series when the Dodgers played yeah. the Yankees in the 40s or, or 57 or whatever the hell year that was, Chinch. So yeah. I was like all in. I'm like, yeah. Um, and I embraced it, man. I, I, we were the little engine that could. If you look at our roster compared to the Yankee roster and their brand names and our brand names, like, you know, we didn't compare, but we won mm. because of the collective unit. Like, and I, and I say this all the time and, I, and it, it pisses me off when people who've never played d- debunk team chemistry. Right. I never hate played that. on a team. Oh, joke. I hate that. It mm. totally yeah, matters. never played on a team. I want Sean Casey and Rich Cinchimino and all my teammates to feel awesome. Right. I want them to get in their cars and they can't wait to get to the field and there's yeah. no head trash, and there's no bullshit, and they're happy to be there and they're pulling all on the same side of the rope and all that all that right. stuff that cliche. Yeah, stuff, yeah you that actually another book. Here's another book that I read. John uh, Wooden. Wooden. Mm. John Wooden so is good. uh you yeah. know that you talk about team team team. So we had that. We had that with our with our club. Yeah, so, I've heard just as many stories you tell about Todd Pratt as you've told about Mike Piazza. Like you have that you had that much of a group where you guys were all kind of equals in some yes, ways. Yes, right? yes. Not only Johnny Franco, but Matt Franco and Joe McEwing yeah. and uh, Vance Wilson and like dudes that like weren't our everyday guys. Like like you talk about like fight for each other. Yeah, you know whether yeah hanging out. Th- th- those teams were legit and dri- driven by. It seemed like in Piazza in that lineup. Um, I want to go back to that next year. Um, you have to the Subway Series in 2000, 2001, because obviously our whole country, the whole world was hit hard uh, at 9-11 when the towers were hit. Um, and then baseball was canceled for a couple of weeks. We were in Chicago with the Reds at the time. We bust home. But when baseball came back, I, you guys with the Mets – and Piazza hitting that home run to win the game um, back when you guys first came back. And you also came out wearing the fire uh, department and the, and the yeah. NYPD hats. Can you take us back to why did you end up wearing those hats? And what was it like coming back in New York City, in Shea Stadium, and even the night when Piazza homered? Yeah. So uh, for all of us, right. But we were at ground zero as far as the first big public event uh, where a lot of people were convening. Um, You know, the the quandary for me was that uh, at the time leading up to the game, baseball seemed so irrelevant. And, uh, and the fact that living in Manhattan and literally being around a couple of miles up uptown from where it happened. It really felt weird to prepare for a baseball game, you know, with knowing that people, uh, you know, not only the loved ones and the people who died, but the people who are feeling the pain. Um, but once they realized, you know, once we, okay, we're going to go ahead and play, we're going to do this. Uh, the, the, the concern was, are we safe? Once we established and we had uh, federal agents and NYPD and uh, unbelievable level of security. So we knew we were safe. And then once the game and the pageantry played out, and then you mentioned a case with Mike, our hero, our star, hits a big home run that wins the game against our ultimate nemesis, uh, the Braves, like total Mm. thorn in our side and badass uh, organization, unbelievable team. You know, it – it made me realize as I drove home late that night uh, that we were hundred percent doing the right thing because there were so many people that were feeling uh, the pain and, and trying to heal. 
And it sounds cliche, but we were totally a distraction for many people right. to get away from it. Well, plus you couldn't change the channel. There was no, there was nothing other than that on television. That game you guys played was maybe the very first thing where it's like, it, it just wasn't, it was about a, something else happening on television. Yeah. I, I thought. Yeah. yeah, no, you're right. It was it, not, not only New York, but it was, it was national, right? I mean, we were, we were, uh, it was it was a big it was a big event, but I, I I think I think how we all felt right. I mean, we all have our story about where we were and you know you know our emotions and all that. And the gamut for me was scared, nervous, sad, mad, pissed off to all of it of of what transpired. But I knew after we played that it was it you know clearly the right thing for us to move forward and, and uh, try to help heal. And we, you know, it was, it was, it was daily. Every time we got to the field, tried to get there early enough, get my work in and then go over to the staging area. And, and we were packing a lot of boxes and supplies and all that. Cause it was behind home plate at the old chase stadium. There was a big area where just, just endless trucks of supplies uh, going down to ground zero. And, um, you know, how could you not think about that, right? You immediately go to the people that were lost. You're thinking about widows and loved ones and little kids and all that. And like, you know, then we go back to behind the Diamond Club and go into the clubhouse and we're going to play a game that night. It was just like, ah. yeah. you know, it was rough. It was, you know. Yeah, I, I feel I feel like, like you said, though, I really feel like it mattered. It mattered that baseball yeah. was back. Some sense of normalcy for our country. Um, but I just know as a fan, you know, watching when, when it came back, when when President Bush throws out the first pitch in Yankee Stadium, when Piazza hits that home run in Shea, yep. for all of us, because New York was the you know was where it was all happening. For all of us, you know that was I think what those were those are very healing moments for our country when you guys came back and did that. So I just you know kudos to absolutely that time. Um, so Al, so you know you fast forward out, you know you, you end up having what an unbelievable journey you've had in the big leagues. You ended up with the Yankees. Can you just take us through that last time on the mound where you walked off and you knew, you know what, this is it. I'm done. Well, I, I, uh, I wanted to finish with the Mets. I, um, you know, but that didn't work out, whatever, uh, you know, cause there were certain, there were certain numbers that I thought would be cool to be mentioned with some of the idols that I grew up, you know, in particular, uh, Tom Seaver, Jerry Kuzman, Dwight Gooden, um, but didn't work out. Signed with the Marlins. I was awful. I'm 39 years old, turning 40. Um, and Cashman, the Yankees, their their pitching was, you know, really going sideways with injuries. And at the trade deadline, they traded for me. And, you know, I remember talking to Cash and I say, Cash, look, I, you know, I, I have something left. Their pitching coach, you talk about full circle. Uh, I mentioned about Gil Patterson earlier, who was with the A's, who was now the AAA pitching coach. He's back with the Yankees. Wow. No. Way. And I said, to, I said to Cash, I said, Cash. Let me go to let me go to Columbus. I've worked with Gil over the years. I love him, and you know, let him straighten me out. And yeah, I I got something left. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good idea, good idea. So they're t- making all these plans for flights and all this other stuff. I get a call back from my agent, Alan Hendricks. He's like, "Well, h- hang tight. I don't, I don't know what's happening. Uh, just hang tight. I don't know. You might not be going to Columbus. Uh, you might be going into business." I mean, all right, yeah, great. Uh, they open up in Boston. Uh, after the break and then I get a call a little bit further later it's Friday now and he said <clears throat> they said get up to New York or get up you got to get up Saturday to uh Boston because you're starting Sunday night oh, Sunday, yeah. night baseball. <laughs> Sunday night baseball Red Sox Yankees <laughs> I'll never forget this game Red Sox Yankees I'm telling you so I uh I'm like all right you know <laughs> I'm thinking like I, I can't get anybody out. You know, I'm doing. I I feel terrible, but my ERA is five. But okay, I'll figure it out. I get to Yankee State. Or no, I get to I get to Boston. It's an afternoon uh, game. I think Randy Johnson was pitching, and uh, he wins. Pitched a great game, and I get to Boston, and it was like I looked. I, I turned the radio on. It's like seventh inning or something. I couldn't even get to the stadium. Mm. So I go to the hotel. <clears throat> The next day, I get on the bus, as we do, right? Yep. I'm starting pitcher. I was with the Mets for seven years, kind of the across-town rival thing that all those guys. I know all the guys on the team, right? But I'm on the – and I basically introduced myself to my new teammates in that visiting the clubhouse at Fenway. You know how small it is. Oh, yeah. 
And I remember being in the training room and Joe Torrey comes in and uh, he says, hello. And I say, you know, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm getting ready. And he said, so, so tell me how much you've been throwing. <laughs> I said, I haven't been throwing much, Joe. <laughs> said, well, tell me what you've been throwing. I'm not kidding. I said, well, I've been playing catch with my son, Jack. He's five years old. <laughs> Jack was five. All-star break. <clears throat> you know, I, whatever. I like, and, um, he turns around. And he's like, "Oh God!" So Posada <laughs> comes in. I tell I tell Jorge, "He's like Jorge, I, you know, I like my cutter. You know, I got to use my curveball. Whatever." We have like a quick scout report meeting, and um, I go out and I, you know, I pitch. I pitch well enough. We win the game. It's you know, it was like it was really a cool you moment. Pitch well enough, Al. You pitched your. Ad. That was one of the best regular season games of that year. Don't undersell what you did. That it night. was. It was a good game. It was a good game. Yeah, I was, it was. It was cool. I. I. Uh, it, I was digging on it. It was like next level, like excitement. Uh, you know, I'm back. Whatever. Yeah, it was. It was. It was very. It made my. You're right, Chinch. It made my season. It did. I was. Uh, yeah, it was great. It, yeah, it was cool. Al, when you look back at your career, now, you know where you're at in your life now. What do you appreciate the most? Uh, well, the opportunity, but the the opportunity to um, to be a major leaguer uh, and appreciated all of what that meant uh, and, and, and really respected being a major leaguer. You know, I, like I, I came up to, I came up to the big leagues when, when the owner of the Yankees, George Steinbrenner, he wouldn't let anybody in the clubhouse. Like clubhouses were meant for you earn to get right. to a major clubhouse. You know, nobody was, there, there weren't people walking through the clubhouse. It was like major league staff, your GM and like, you know, that's it. So I, I always appreciated that, but here, let me, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to finish with this story because it totally put a bow on my whole baseball life. And I, I didn't cry, but twice in baseball. And it was that game and game six of the, of the 2000 world series. When I did pitch my heart out and Louis saw hits a 13 hopper up the middle and, and we lose the world series, but I, I gave everything I could. I really did. It was 143 pitches, whatever we, we lose the game. But, and I felt the exhaustion of everything I put into it. But then in, in, in O spring of 06, I was on the WBC. Uh, we lost to Japan in the semifinals, came back to the Yankees spring training. I went into Joe Torrey and I said, Joe, thank you so much. I appreciate it. But I, I'm done. I'm 40. You know, they wanted me to put me in the pen. I, I, I was just mentally, I was done. I lost, I lost the, the, it, right. And I, and I said, well, how do you want to do this? He's like, Joe is telling me. He's like, oh, I don't know. I'm either sending guys down or I'm releasing them. Nobody retires in spring training. <laughs> Fair enough. I said, but would you do me a favor? Because there's nothing wrong. And I, I still I still can throw. I said, would you give, give me a chance to pitch an inning today? So he's looking at it. Randy Johnson was starting. It was against Cleveland. And he said, I got to get uh, I got to get at least Mo in there. And I think there was another reliever of one of his guys he had to get in. He said, but yeah. I, I should get. I should be able to get you an inning. Randy's mowing like he's got like forty <laughs> pitches after five innings. I'm like, oh, I'm sitting down in the bullpen, and they call down uh, and they they get me up. But before that, I told you about Gil Patterson, who I adore. Yeah. He is a pitching coach in the minor leagues. I called over to him and I said, "Hey, would you come over? I, I'm going to get a chance to pitch today. It's going to be my last game." He was like the only guy that that I told that. Well, no. Uh, the, oh, so here I, I'm. The pitching coach for the New York Yankees in 06 was Ron Guidry. Mm. The hitting coach was Don Mattingly. Oh. And and I have I have Gil Patterson coming over, who was my first pitching coach in Pro Bowl. Wow. wow. And Joe Car- Joe Kerrigan is the bullpen coach. So I get up, I start warming up at in, it's in Tampa. And I'm telling you, guys, I tried to blow my arm out because I wanted to like <laughs> at least justify like, <laughs> And I'm throwing, and I'm telling you, it was probably one of my best bullpens. And Joe Kerrigan, long time pitcher, goes, he's looking at me. He's looking, he's like, You sure you want to retire? I'm like, Yeah, I think so. (laughs) And I'm telling you, Case, I'm like, I'm, I'm, it looks good. So I run in, I'm getting one out. And you know who the out is? Chinch, pull him up. Eduardo Perez. Ah. Eduardo Perez. Eduardo, yes. And Eduardo crushes lefties and he crushes me. Crushes lefties. That is hysterical. So I'm like, holy shit. My one batter is going to be Eduardo Perez, and he takes me deep. <laughs> <laughs> what did he do? <laughs> he grounded out to A-Rod on a little two-seam, 91-mile-hour fastball away, which I don't normally throw. 
A-Rod throws it over to Giambi, and it was like kind of that picture that I showed you earlier, but it was because we had WBC, we had all the all the guys in the game, the whole game, because we right. they were leaving to go start the season. It was late in spring. And Gator comes out to t- get me out, and Jeter's standing there, and A-Rod, and Cano, and uh, he, oh, Gator, Gator, Gidry hugs me. And Jeter looks at me and goes, what's going on? And I'm like, I look at, I look at Derek. I'm like, I just retired. He looks at me. He's like, what? (laughs) (laughs) So they're all looking at me on the mound. I was like, really? It's like, it's kind of a dumb moment. It's like spring training and I'm retiring, you know, like, but I didn't tell anybody. So I walk into the dugout and I sit down and, you know, it's like one of those, all right, this is it. I don't know what your last game was case, but, and uh, I'm in Tampa spring training guys coming up. Hey, you know, and they're kind of getting wind that like Allied is retired. Gil Patterson comes over, he hugs me, and I kind of start losing it. Like my first year as an as an 18 year old player in Oneonta, New York, my pitching coach was Gil Patterson, and here he is, is you know, 23 years later, he's hugging me. Don Mattingly comes over, hugs me. He was my first baseman in my first game. Ron Guidry was a teammate. God. And then the Holy year God. I was drafted, this is where it like got me. The year I was drafted, Yogi Berra was the manager in 1984, the Yankees. Yogi, because Yogi always was in spring training, he walked over and he hugged me. Oh, my Jeez. God. Guys, I started losing. I'm like, wow. oh, my God. Like, there was too many coincidences. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. Like, so it was like this fast forward train of 23 years. And it was all like right in front of me. I'm like, oh, my God. Like, wow, you know, man. it's like. You know, I didn't do much of anything for the Yankees, but it so felt right. Uh, yeah. Like this, yeah. It, per- it put perfect bookends onto an unbelievable career. It bookended your career. Came in with the Yankees as a, as, you know, as a guy, then gets traded, and you end with the Yankees. You said yeah. it bookended an amazing career, which is like, what an awesome yeah. story, man. That's so yeah, awesome. it was cool. Well, bro, I, I, we, Chinson and I can't thank you enough, man, for coming on. You know, it's really? so funny when we, we were first getting this going. Al and I had a conversation, literally. I mean, I think we're two, three shows into it. We, I was in my kitchen, and I was telling Al we're getting the mayor's office started. And, you know, Al always has those good ideas. You know, we were we were kind of, you know, bouncing some ideas off each other. So, brother, to have you on, you know, at this stage, yeah, we're, we can't teach experience. We're getting a little better. But thanks, man. The, the journey of Al Leiter, the journey what Jack Leiter is going to do is going to be fun to watch. And uh Thank you for taking your time, brother. We'll, yeah, I'll man. see you soon at the network at some yeah, point here. Please. I, I, I'm just glad you finally asked me. <laughs> <laughs> you, you want to make sure we were good, yeah, though. We sure we're good. Good because now. if we weren't good, the first person that would tell us that we sucked <laughs> is our <Al> life. <laughs> <laughs> but honestly, like, dude. You guys are horse shit. You guys are horse shit. Is what he's all, yeah. out of, all out of love, guys. All out of love. Yeah, Al, you've been, to me uh, personally, you've been like a big brother. And for the people at home that don't understand, this man is so rich, he does not need to get out of bed in the morning, <laughs> but he does, and he works extremely hard on everything he does, which is a testament to the human being he is, and I love you, man. I'm really, really sad that you. you did this with us. Thank you. I appreciate it. Really, guys. Really. Thank and you, I, I hope I hope you blow this up, guys. Really. it's it's. Yeah. Uh, I, I see what's out there, and uh, it could only get better and more refined and all of it. Thanks, man. Thanks, and, all, and one final thing that we didn't get to in the background is that Roberto Clemente Award. That was that was I know that was a huge yes. thing for you. That's a big deal for anyone plays in the biggest game of the Roberto Clemente Award. That means you're impacting the community and impact the people like you still are, Al. We love you, brother. And Thank we will, you. We will see you soon, okay. man. Thank you so much. Thanks, Al. See you, buddy. <laughs> see you. Wow, Chinch, I've been waiting for that one for a long time, and yeah. you know, one of the best. One of the best dudes going, and what a heck of a player, man! One, I, I, in my opinion, one of the be- better lefties the game's ever seen. Yeah, and it, it just took him a little bit to get going. You know, all the injuries at the beginning really didn't get hit his stride till '93 with the Blue Jays. Right. So, I mean, do the math. You know, what I mean, those first few years. You know, yeah, totally. And to be have a chance to put up the numbers, right? And to be a native New Jersey guy, so a tri-state area guy, like I got, I have that poster up. You know, <laughs> that was what twenty-two years ago. That was, yeah. and like, the, what that team did, and I grew up a Yankee fan, but I was always an outlier fan, just because he was from around yeah. here, and, and just because of the, the work ethic, you can tell the type of person he was, you know, like I say, I joke about how rich he is, but you talk about down-to-earth human being, and somebody who actually works hard on everything he does, I mean that as a purpose, and he brought a lot back to his home town. 
that was gone. They had not made the playoffs in 11 years by the time he got to the Mets. Then he did pretty much had a lot to do with taking them to the World Series. But again, like you said, he just he's always been a mentor to me and to people that get into the industry. And, and he is so he'll make fun of you the day he meets you. But he'll treat you the same every way. And if you're a good person, he treats you good. And he's just he is one of my favorite people I know. He's been like a big brother to me. He's he's put me in check sometimes because of that leadership role. And I've deserved it and needed it. And and I'm sure like you and him have talked shop and, and how to do things and whatever. And I really care about that guy. And everybody, everything that you see on TV, folks, that's that man. It's him. Flat out. Yeah. And he keeps it honest. You know, he's, he keeps it real. Right. If he doesn't like something, he's gonna t- he'll tell you about it. Yeah. But, you know, also, too. They can talk about his work ethic at the at the network. The demos that he does are yeah. so in depth. They go into the mind of the pitcher and and you know sequencing and all that stuff. And he's won an mm-hmm. Emmy doing it. So everything Al's done, he succeeded, and it's just pretty cool to see. Yeah. It's going to be really fun to see Jack Leiter. Really cool to what see Jack Leiter. He looks yeah. like a nice, handsome young Al Leiter out there on a mound. It'd be fun to see his career <laughs> develop. All right, man, another great one. Uh, You're the best. Man. All right, Chigi, awesome man, awesome, and uh, for everyone out there, man. Go hit the uh, follow us at the mayor's office and uh, go download, subscribe, do all those things. But we're grateful you guys are joining us and uh, have a great, grateful day. Chinchy, I love you, brother. Love you, buddy. I will see you next. See you next week. All right. Chinch. Support this week for the mayor's office is brought to you by Manscaped, who is the best in men's below-the-waist grooming champions of the world. Manscaped offers precision-engineered tools for your family jewels. Manscaped just launched their fourth-generation trimmer, the Lawnmower 4.0. You heard that right, the 4.0, baby. Join over 4 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with this exclusive offer for you. 20% off and free worldwide shipping with the code the Mayor at manscaped.com. I tell you what though, I love these things, Change. I've had them. I've had Manscaped 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, and this is the 4.0. This one it has a new sleek design. It's perfect for guys like me though, dude. I'm one of the hairiest guys going. That's a fact. And, for, and as the fact, and forever, man, forever, I've been looking for the best trimmers. Even going way back years of when I was playing, I'd always nick myself up, cut myself as the worst. These trimmers right here, man, they are the best. They are the absolute best. Trims up my back, trims up my arm, the jewels, whatever it takes. Yeah. But this trimmer is the absolute best. The 4.0, the lawnmower from Manscaped. I can vouch for that. I know Sean wears a sweater 24 hours a day, <laughs> 365 days a year, and he needs this. He sent me one. I'm so psyched. I shave with it. That's how good you got, it is. That's how yeah, and it is. Chinch, I've tried every, every one you could try, every clipper you could possibly buy, I've tried. Yeah. This by far is the best. Yeah, Sean puts a clipper on his, it, it'll break the clippers, but not the manscaper. Yeah. So Every, everyone, everyone should have this, bro. Everyone yeah, no, should have one of these. They absolutely should. So here's how you get it, okay? You get 20% off and free shipping with the code the mayor, right, Sean? The mayor yes. at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping, manscaped.com, and use the code the mayor. Unlock your confidence and always use the right tools for the job with Manscaped. And you can look as clean as Casey does now. When he, <laughs> when he doesn't need a Manscaper, it's like Sasquatch. There's the, the people call cops. Unbelievable. Lawnmower 4.0. Go get it. It's unbelievable, Chinch. Do it.